Welcome everyone to the 34th edition of Vogelheads on Investing. Today our special guest is Jason Su. Jason is one of the smartest investors I've met. He has published more than 40 peer-reviewed articles, won numerous awards, he co-created the fundamental indexing concept, and today focuses on inefficiencies in Chinese stocks. Hi everyone, my name is Rick Ferry and I'm the host of Bogle Heads on Investing. This episode, as with all episodes, is brought to you by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Visit us at boglecenter.net and your tax-deductible donations are greatly appreciated. Today we have a special guest, Jason Su. Jason he graduated with a degree in physics from California Institute of Technology was awarded his Masters of Science in Finance from Stanford University and earned his PhD in Finance from UCLA, where he conducted research on the equity risk premium, business cycles, and portfolio asset allocations. Jason has authored more than 40 peer-reviewed articles. He is associate editor of the Journal of Investment Management and serves on the editorial board of the Financial Analyst Journal, the Journal of Index Investing, the Journal of Investment Counseling, and the Journal of Investment Management. Professionally, Jason has been on the forefront of factor investing as one of the founders of research affiliates and now has taken factor investing to a new level as he applies it to the Chinese stock market. So with no further ado, let me introduce Jason Su. Welcome to the Bogleheads on Investing podcast, Jason. Glad to be here, Rick. Well, it's great that you joined us. I've always been super impressed with your background and all the things that you've done in the financial services industry and the investment management industry, been a very successful person. Although I have to say you, you kind of fly under the radar and that you've done so much and you've got so many awards, but well, you may have fortune, but you don't have the fame, which is a little bit odd in a way, given who you are and, and everything that you've done. And so maybe we'll elevate that a little bit here, <laughs> at least among the Bogleheads. So I've been a big fan of yours for years. And before we get started, tell us, going as far back as you feel comfortable, a little bit about your background. Well, going really far back, Rick, I came to this country really as an immigrant. No, you know, I arrived when I was 10. Uh, at the time, I spoke, I think, no English. Uh, but the country's been really, really good to me. I learned a tremendous amount. And eventually I found myself at Caltech studying to be a, a physicist. You got into California Institute of Technology and you decided you were going to be a physicist. And you excelled in that. You actually graduated summa cum laude in physics what happened after that? I mean, you made a, a pivot for sure. Yeah. The one thing that I experimented with while at Caltech was I did sort of a weekend gig at a economic laboratory where they had students play essentially market games. And then we were the, the subject of the experimentation. And I was really good at those games. Eventually, they prevented me from participating. And, then, uh, and that's when I got to learn about uh, markets and about equilibrium and also about market efficiency and how competition leads to price efficiency and how that generally leads to better outcome for, for everyone involved. What year was this when all this was going on? Uh, 1994. So I was a sophomore. And then you decided after you graduated to pursue a master's of science in finance at Stanford University. You've got some pretty good schools in your background. Uh, yeah, I, I decided to you know, learn about financial markets, uh, really be an economist and understand how this stock market thing work, how the capital markets work, how, how that's relevant to the real economy and, and I guess uh, to, to how society <laughs> Uh, are, are shaped as a result of how these markets uh, interact. And then from there, you went on to get your PhD at UCLA. That's right. And what was your PhD thesis? Uh, so I, I was studying 
the differences between American households and Asian households. And the thing that I was trying to understand is why do Asian households say too much and American households say too little? And as a result, what you see is Asian households participate in the stock market uh, very directly and very meaningfully, and, and American households do not, right? The, the participation is very indirectly through their defined benefit pension plans or 401k. There's really very little of individual wealth outside of retirement plan that's committed to the stock market. So, so that was kind of the primary thing that I studied. Well, it's interesting, and we're going to get to this a little bit later on in the podcast, but it's interesting now that you've circled back to that with your uh, new company in a way to try to capitalize on these individuals in the market as opposed to through institutions. I can see where, where you ended up going with all this is a little bit where you currently are right now. And without getting too far ahead, is, is that true? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know at the time that that was going to be of any practical usefulness, really. I was very much set on pursuing a academic research career. It really was through a sequence of I guess, happy coincidence that that ended up being a more of a practitioner than a academic scholar. Uh, It's like a bigger uh, accident that, uh, you know, 20, 20, 25 years later, it ended up being quite useful uh, (laughs) given the business I'm in. Uh, But you did do a lot of uh, academics. I mean, you were an adjunct professor and you were a visiting professor at various colleges, both here and in Asia. And you did get that the feel for being an academic. Yes, I I did put my PhD to good use. And you also wrote many papers. You wrote 40 peer-reviewed papers. And could you explain what the difference is between just writing something and having it published in a peer review paper? Yeah, so it is now fashionable in our industry for firms to do white papers. And, you know, white papers feel a little less marketing and salesy and perhaps, you know, more educational and neutral. Uh, But frankly, oftentimes the quality uh, is suspect. And then you can definitely see an angle where this is just a dressed up marketing document. When it's peer reviewed journal article, whether it's industry journals or academic journals, they're meant to be educational, right? You're supposed to do research that answers an important question and you're supposed to use methods that are robust uh, that is replicable, and the conclusion you draw from it has to be logical. And and there's at least one referee, if not two, and the journal editor will also sort of vet the paper to ensure that it is truly educational and useful and, uh, and then not sort of a sales document in disguise. So it's a much higher bar that's required in terms of rigor and the time committed to doing a peer review article. Uh, you know, most Articles are submitted to journals are actually rejected, and even the ones that get accepted go through two, three rounds of editing and re-editing. You are also very familiar with getting articles published. Not only have you written 40 peer-reviewed articles, but you're also a member of the editorial board for the Financial Analyst Journal. You're a trustee for the CFA Institute Research Foundation. You're an associate editor for the Journal of Index Investing, an associate editor for the Journal of Investment Management. You could tell the difference, I think, if anybody could, between something that's a marketing piece and something that is a actual academic paper. Yep. Uh, part of that is the PhD training, and part of that is also you know, being on both sides of the table, um, you know, writing something as a scholar, And of course, uh, being a gatekeeper to ensure that only scholarly pieces sort of come through. And uh, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. Yeah. You also have been in the field. You've you've got a distinguished career, not only in academics, but also you have a distinguished career uh, in the investment management field, first as the co-founder of Research Affiliates and co-founded that with Rob Arda. Can you give me a little history? Because I've, I know Rob and I've known him for many years and he's an interesting uh, character. But I'd like to know how that all came about. Yeah, uh, again, you know, as I mentioned, a very lucky coincidence. Uh, so I was at the UCLA uh, really finishing up. That was my last year in a PhD program. And 
Rob had just sold and exited out of his last company, First Quadrant, and decided to volunteer at UCLA Anderson School. Of course, you know, the, the dean uh, was very excited having someone who, who's so well known and who at some point in the future could, could be a very meaningful donor to business school. And so we were put together to uh, co-teach a class together. Uh, because, you know, obviously I, I've been, been a lecturer at UCLA by that time for a number of years. And uh, Rob, obviously, someone with great war stories. So the dean thought that would be a great pairing. <laughs> uh, and so that's how we got to know each other. And, you know, Rob is someone, I guess, at that time, still very young, had, had a lot of ambition and had a lot more left in his tank. And uh, he quickly decided, well, you know, he, he said, hey, you know, I'm going to start something. And Jason, would you be interested in uh, joining in the startup? And that's how we got started. Literally two guys in a garage because we didn't have office back then. And then, you know, uh, a Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> a living room in a Bloomberg. That's how I actually got started myself in the advisor business. So I understand how, where you're coming from on that. Uh, but that's interesting. And tell us originally about the focus of research affiliates. What is it that you were trying to do? with that company? And then what did it evolve into? Like many startups that eventually succeed, what the original founder set out to do uh, is often not what ended up being successful. So I think when Rob and I first got started, a number of ideas we, we tried. Like we initially wanted to offer software, actually. a And it was way ahead of its time, right? It was a smart software to help wealth management platform to manage wrap accounts. So it would be very intelligent in terms of uh, tax loss harvesting, uh, crossing, uh, offsetting trades. That great idea, probably ahead of its time, at the time when technology was uh, a lot more expensive, a lot more unwieldy. So that didn't fly, uh, but I still think it, it was a great idea. And later on, others have clearly done a much better job with that idea. Uh, we then set out to do uh, liability defeasement strategy, again, a clever strategy that played off of the way the yield curve uh, worked. And we thought there's going to be great demand, but I think liability defeasement, you know, back in the, in the early 2000s was still a little too early for most pension funds. So again, a decent idea. I even got a seed investor to trial the program, but didn't actually go anywhere. Was a, almost a side hustle, uh, which was uh, sub-advising a asset allocation mutual fund, kind of a little pilot experiment for PIMCO. And that ended up taking off and became a runaway success. Uh, and then like, I think what most of you know us for, eventually we use the income from that product to develop fundamental indexing, uh, which is what today, you know, research affiliates, what Rob and I are, are probably best known for and likely will be best remembered for. I recall all of this because I was in the industry at the time and watching this happen. And to me, DFA, Dimensional Fund Advisors, had a real head start on this factor investing, fundamental indexing strategy. But you did it in an exchange traded fund form mostly, and you captured that market fairly quickly. Back in the early 2000s, ETF was a very new concept. A lot of people didn't know what it was, right? Because mutual fund at the time was the vehicle of choice. All the big ETF players you know of today didn't exist back then. And probably back then, they, they didn't want to do ETF. They thought it was a stupid thing to do. So very early on, after we wrote the paper on fundamental indexing, we were contacted by Bruce Bond and Ben Fulton. You know, they started PowerShares. And they said they are looking for innovative indexes on top of which they can create ETFs on. And they knew it, it wouldn't make sense for them to do an S&P and compete with a spider. Uh, so they really wanted something that was very differentiated. And uh, they, they saw our research paper that was published in the uh, Financial Analyst Journal and said, look, this is it. This is it. Uh, and so, you know, we, we met one snowing afternoon in New York. Agreed to a deal, found FTSE, uh, had had FTSE basically convert our fundamental index methodology into an index. Just to clarify, FTSE is who? Yeah, 
FTSE is one of the largest index calculators in the, in the world, owned by the London Stock Exchange. And they took your methodology and created an index out of it? That's right. It was one of the things that I looked at and I personally said, well, this isn't an index. This is active management. <laughs> and that was really a debate, you know, back then. I know that ship has sailed because the SEC said, yes, it's an index. But back then, I can recall the mudslinging that went on between you or your company and uh, Standard & Poor's as to what is an index. But I think that the SEC allowed all this to be called indexing, and, and there it was. Much different than what the slang became, and the slang became smart beta, which at first you embraced, but then later on, it didn't seem like you were embracing it so much. Yeah, so Rick, I got to tell you the backstory to that. Uh, so we didn't come up with uh, the moniker Smart Beta. Uh, you know, we, we called our strategy fundamental indexing, and we really were trying to play off of cap weighted indexing, right? We think of oh, cap weighted indexing is market capitalization, which is determined by price times shares outstanding. So really, there's a lot of price indexing in in that construct, and we wanted to play off of price base indexing, again, something that's not price, but still related to value. So you know, we think of you know, company fundamentals. So we said, okay, now fundamental indexing would be this play on word, and it would contrast against, say, you know, cap-weighted or price-based indexing. And that's really how we came up with the name. Mm -hmm. And like you say, most people uh, didn't think what we created was an index because everyone had, had you know, by that time, come to, uh, except that the index should be cap weighted because that's how S&P is built. And, you know, there, there's a paper by, by Bill Sharp and others that talk about the merit of cap weighting as a index, as a portfolio construct. Uh, and so we were really swimming upstream against that established school of thought. Uh, and as we were talking to investment consultants, uh, financial advisors, uh, most people said, look, you, you got an active strategy. It's not an index. So you, you really you know, shouldn't be in the ETF space because ETF is really meant to track passive indices for people who believe in market efficiency. And so we actually had a lot of struggle in, in sure. the early get-go. And I think I was part of that struggle. I was the one sitting in the audience raising my <laughs> hand yelling at you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I do remember that. <laughs> well, anyway, it took a lot. I mean, fundamental indexing, uh, you know, I talked with Rob not about this. It, I think it's an everlasting term. Uh, but, you know, the smart beta isn't it because it kind of dirties the water and muddies the water, in my opinion. OK, this thing takes off then. I mean, you start rolling like a steamroller with fundamental indexing due to great returns from uh, value stocks uh, after the tech wreck in the early 2000s. I mean, you're on the radar and, and things are growing. Can you just take us through that? part of the growth of the company. Yeah, absolutely. So from the initial get-go where, you know, people didn't even like the word indexing to it being embraced by, I think it was first by, um, at the time, you know, Powers Watson, uh, later on Mercer, and they coined the category name Smart Beta. And, and like you say, it, it just grew like wildfire once consultants sort of validated the concept with a category name. And we were the first you know, uh, off the board, uh, yeah, we just had momentum behind us being the first mover, being the claim to the original IP. We, yeah, we, we had a lot of, uh, I would say, active-oriented pension funds who say, hey, you know, we heard about the merit of a lower-cost, more transparent index strategy, but we're not ready to go full-on passive into this, the S&P 500. So, Going into a fundamental index is kind of like halfway move mm -hmm. going from mm -hmm. full active to full passive. And then that was a good compromise for, I think, a lot of pension funds and their investment consultants. And similarly, I think we had a lot of people who already bought into the concept of indexing and love and understood the ETF chassis who said, well, you know, here is a index product. Um, that could actually have uh, 
some credible success in delivering outperformance uh, slightly more consistently uh, and slightly more scientifically. And so we, we kind of were attracting flows from both sides of the argument, right? Attracting flows from active uh, investors and attracting flows from some passive investors. And, and that really, uh, like you say, it, it sort of steamrolled through the industry uh, and then put research affiliates on the map. Yeah, I remember this whole period of time and I remember discussions uh, with you and, and discussions. I know I had discussions with Rob about this. I, it was, look, you're, you're sort of barking up the wrong tree. This is initially, this is right at the beginning once you came out with fundamental indexing. Uh, I remember saying, you know, don't go after the cap weighted index first. Don't go after them. I mean, that's not your market. Your market is active management because what you've done here is you've lowered the cost of active management and you've made it more consistent than what it was in the past because you have a set of rules and, and that's the enduring part of what you're doing. So in my view, uh, it was exactly what you said about a lot of these pension funds. Look, we're not ready to go from active to, to cap weighted indexing, but what we're ready to do, at least partially, is to go from active to fundamental indexing and at least lower our cost and make things more consistent. When that shift happened, you know, the, the kind of the mental shift of marketing, if you will, happened, I think that really helped to propel the whole industry that you, that you started. Yeah, Rick, you're absolutely right. I think your, your prediction and, and your advice at the time uh, turned out to be, I think, key. Uh, I think ultimately we attract a lot more assets from the active camp uh, who who really haven't had that much success with active management, but you know I think it's you know, going full fully to pure passive uh, took some meandering I think before uh, they could fully sort of get on board and uh, and you know going to fundamental indexing was kind of a safe middle way uh, compromise. And like I said, it really cut co- cut the cost of doing yep. it, and it right. was consistent. Right. I mean, you, when you're following a strategy like you're following, and you have to follow a systematic methodology, you don't get manager whims don't get in the way. I mean, if you believe in the methodology and you look at the data and you say, well, it worked in the past and this is why it worked in the past. And so we know that since it's a quote unquote index, that this is the methodology that's going to be used in the future. So we can rely on that rather than relying on the manager to one day be a value manager and the next day they're not so much a value manager because that's just not where the momentum is at the time, that there was a lot of value to that. And I have to believe that that's continuing to be that way. Although it was a struggle, right? I mean, after the financial crisis occurred, value investing, fundamental indexing, although a lot of assets were going that direction, those factors didn't perform well. I want to get into here a little bit that they're not always going to perform well and that there is a uh, you know, 25 year, I don't want to say cycle or something, a wave to these things and that uh, people who are in it uh, need to be patient. Yeah, Rick, I mean, I think what we saw in you know, 25 years, probably going on 30 years, uh, there are really two things happening in the background that's made it difficult to be a value investor and given value is a big underpinning of the fundamental index methodology. Uh, it's, it's been tough for value investors in fundamental index uh, the last 30 years. And part of what's driving that is market has become more efficient, right? If you think of value as an anomaly, meaning you can buy good quality assets cheap, right? That's not supposed to happen, right? Good quality assets are supposed to be expensive. And it's all it's generally the risky stuff that's supposed to be cheaper. So you're, you're generally supposed to see value stocks is more expensive, not cheaper, if they're truly high quality, right? Uh, so a lot of the value premium, you could say, was an anomaly for whatever reason it, it existed. But as the market gets more efficient, it's supposed to go away. So I think part of the diminishing value premium is related to the U.S. market becoming ever more institutional, ever more efficient, and any anomalies that's been documented historically is are down uh, or just less relevant. But you also have, I think, the last few years, if you're looking at, you know, Reddit, uh, you know, <laughs> you're looking at uh, Robinhood uh, trading, you're looking at prices for cryptocurrency and GameStop stocks, 
you also recognize that U.S. market has the last few years became probably more inefficient. Right? I think retail trading has gone from 3% to closer to 30% now. Uh, and where exciting, sexy growth has, has done much better because that's where the retail sort of flows and retail trading have been concentrating on. So you got two things, right? One is market becoming more efficiently price, which make value work less well. And then more recently, the market sort of, you know, kind of gone into a bit of a tech bubble, which has a further punished value. And you combine yeah. those two together, it's been tough to be to be a value investor. But has that been true internationally? And let's kind of work outside the U.S. now and look internationally at developed markets and then secondly, emerging markets. Is it becoming more efficient? Yeah. So generally, I would say when you when you want to get a sense of efficiency, probably the best indicator to look at is the fraction of the trading volume that's accounted for by retail trading. Because, you know, I guess market efficiency is about price discovery. So it's about uh, well-informed, analytical, rational, experienced investors, you know, making trades. And when you're talking about individuals, uh, that that's not you know what drives efficiency. So if you look at uh, developed markets, by and large, are very institutionalized because they have giant pension funds and and very developed uh, mutual fund and wealth management industry. So most of the money's been delegated out, and ultimately the people who who manage these assets are are experienced. They're, so it's basically super smart, experienced traders and PMs competing against each other. So markets tend to be more efficient. That's by and large, not what you see in emerging markets. Many of them have underdeveloped wealth management market. Uh, their mutual fund industry is in their nascent stage. Uh, a lot of the trading are still just done by individual investors who are gambling in the stock market. And so as a result, efficiency is generally poor. And the funny thing is in the Asian emerging markets, I would say the efficiencies are particularly poor uh, part of the, you might say, might be culture for gambling. Uh, a lot of the Asian investing is more gambling than, than really retirement planning or retirement saving. And also what you see is Asian households, like my dissertation found out, they save way too much. And some of that money end up going to the stock market unproductively. So back to research affiliates. Are you still associated with research affiliates? I'm a associated with the research affiliate uh, as an advisor. So I exited or I spun out of research affiliates in 2016 to launch uh, Rayland Global Advisors to focus on basically China. We are now a specialty uh, China manager, you know, working with uh, large institutions uh, as well as financial advisors to help them get access to all things China. Uh, that's my new focus now, and it's because that's where I think, as a researcher, as a portfolio manager, we could still create alpha consistently and reliably net a fees. Research Affiliates was a research shop. You actually didn't manage investment portfolios there. You were doing research and you were creating the methodologies for choosing stocks and weighting stocks. Is that what your company, Reliant, is also? Research Affiliates had a very small book of business that was uh, running assets directly, but it was so small as to be not known by, by uh, most people who've done business with us. Rayleigh and Global Advisors, we now are more like a traditional quantitative active manager. We both develop the, the IP, the strategy, and while we do license them out to other larger asset managers who wanted our research uh, and, and our strategies, we also have a thriving practice in terms of uh, creating our own funds. Right, we got we have funds in China, in in US, and we run uh, segregated accounts for institutional clients. So we got a different business model now versus research affiliates. So let's get into all of the research that you did on factor investing that was pretty much centered on US investors and the US markets with fundamental indexing initially. I know you expanded that globally, but you primarily started it in the US markets and a lot of the work that you did, a lot of your papers and so forth were on the US markets. You take these tools that you created, this research, you bring them to China. And now the first thing you do is take those and uh, did you attempt to apply them to the Chinese market? 
And if so, what happened? Yep. So first thing I did was just apply everything as is, right? So I've taken all of the anomaly factors that we documented in, in academia uh, based on U.S. data and say, well, do they work in China? And surprisingly or not surprisingly, they work in China and they work quite well. And when I thought about it, I go, oh, of course, right? A lot of the anomaly factors for the U.S., they, they sort of lived in the past and are sort of less effective or almost non-effective uh, the last 10, 15 years because markets become so efficient. But they certainly work when, when the U.S. market was less efficient. Now, if you're applying those same intuition um, to China, uh, it being a much more inefficient market, these anomalies ought to be larger. And since these anomalies are often related to uh, retail individuals and their behavioral biases, right? You know, uh, mental accounting, loss aversion, preference for high volatility uh, as sort of lottery substitutes. So you see all of that in China in spades. So what used to work in the U.S. that maybe doesn't work anymore, are alive and well in China. I listened to your podcast uh, with Jeff Patak and uh, Christine Benz on uh, Morningstar Longview, and you were talking about a 9% performance gap between Chinese fund returns and investors in those funds. And just for some background, in the U.S., that gap has been closing significantly uh, over the last 10 or 15 years and the gap between mutual fund returns and, and market returns and client investor returns has really narrowed down. In fact, balanced funds, which you're actually getting an alpha now by being in a balanced fund. Uh, but this is not the case in China. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, there, there are two things that are super surprising when you look at uh, Chinese fund data. First of all, uh, if you just track the average mutual fund in China, on a net of cost basis, they outperform by about 4% per annum. Hmm. So this is adjusting for survivorship bias, obviously taking costs into account. So this is really net performance. And of course, that's not what you see in the U.S., right? In the U.S., net of cost, the average mutual fund uh, underperforms. Uh, so that's Correct. the first surprising thing. Now, again, you know, this if you think about it, it, just tells you U.S. market very efficient, therefore even well-trained portfolio managers can't consistently beat the market. In China, it's very inefficient. So someone who's a trained money manager, he's basically extracting alpha from essentially retail gamblers. So that's the first surprising thing. The next surprising thing is the mutual fund industry in China is very underdeveloped, meaning most people don't trust mutual fund managers enough to buy mutual funds. They, they somehow trust their own skill more or prefer to gamble. Uh, and so as a result, um, you know, they uh, speculate in the stock market uh, to, to obviously great detriment of their, their own wealth. Uh, so that's another thing we see in China. Despite the outperformance, uh, mutual fund industry is in its very nascent stage. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, not grown very fast at all. I was reading a research paper that you put out, China's Got Talent, Fund Manager Skill and Alpha in Chinese Stocks, and you track the growth of the mutual fund industry, and back in 1999, there was a whopping 22 mutual funds for all of China. But by the end of 2020, you wrote, there was almost 8,000 mutual funds, so and most of them were developed in the last, call it, seven years. How do you think this is going to affect the efficiencies, of the market efficiency in China? So usually I would be on the side of uh, competition will bring about greater efficiency. Uh, as I study more time with the data, uh, what I have discovered when I look at this proliferation of mutual funds are really two things. One is... Most mutual funds in China uh, are very concentrated. So unlike the U.S., where most mutual funds are benchmark huggers, right, uh, where kind of, you know, you're looking at closet indexers and therefore, you know, net of cost, it's very hard for them to beat the index. In China, most of the mutual funds are quite concentrated. 
they would have enormously large bets on a sector, sometimes on a single stock. And you kind of think about, well, why, why does that happen, right? That goes against diversification. It goes against sensible uh, portfolio management. The reason it happens is Chinese fund investors are very short-term oriented, meaning they look at mutual fund performance leaks table uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, they would buy a fund, and if they see another fund that had the better performance uh, the next time they pick up a newspaper, uh, they would be trading out of their last fund to get into this new hot fund. And as a result, if you're a mutual fund company and you want to not lose asset or at least keep the asset within your family of funds, you've got to constantly launch a new fund that's mm. for flavor of day, theme of the day, and that's very concentrated. So when the theme is right, you have insane performances. Uh, and so that's largely what describes the funds industry in China. So this fund proliferation uh, hasn't brought about better price discovery or better competition. Uh, it's really just everyone is creating more and more extreme portfolios trying to benefit from the volatility effect so they can randomly become the best performer and gather a lot of assets. You know, it does remind me of the mutual fund industry in the United States, say, in the 70s and 80s. There was a lot of that going on. I think that Fidelity um, would create a fund based on whatever. It didn't matter what it was. We're going to create it and we're going to launch it uh, because people want it. And even though the owners of that company would never put a dime of their own money in it, it didn't matter. Uh, they're in the mutual fund business. And if this is what people want, then we're going to give it to them. Now, that's not so much anymore in the United States. It's, I think it's become too expensive to do that. And it's thinned out as far as the amount of money that's available. So it's almost become almost prohibitively expensive to do that. You still see some of that perhaps in the ETF industry, but just not as much as they used to be. But it seems like in China, this, this is the what is going on. Yes, it is the mainstream practice. Uh, and so the fund proliferation really hasn't created a competition to lower fees uh, or a competition for sort of better practices in portfolio management that leads to then better price discovery, which then would lead to a more efficient market. Uh, so we're, we're many, many innings away from getting to, to that outcome. Now, the, the market in China, if you want to use a, an indice, I'm just looking at the China MSCI stock price index. Uh, there is a beta there, although that if you look back in the, from 1995 through 2001, there this market collapsed about, well, it looks like 95%. And then it came roaring back from 2002 up to 2007 by I don't know how many multiples. <laughs> uh, and then it collapsed again during the financial crisis, and now it's been crawling back up again. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, beta invest? People who say, well, I, I, I get what you're saying about the inefficiencies in the market, and that if I used an active manager, that I might do better, but... I don't wouldn't I wouldn't know you know one active manager from another of course without you know getting into your firm yet of course but uh, you know what if you just bought beta I mean would that work in China? So if you just bought beta, uh, it would have worked out okay the last fifteen years. Uh, prior to that, not so much. Now the question is, well, is that just me cherry picking the last fifteen years? Well, no, uh, because. Prior to the last 15 years, beta is poorly constructed in the following sense. It was mostly state-owned enterprises. There weren't a lot of companies. And so when you kind of bought that beta, uh, you actually really had just a very concentrated exposure to a few large state-owned entities. And then that, I don't think, is what you want to buy when you're betting on you know, the growth of China, the transformation from being an export-oriented economy into a more consumption-based economy where you're hoping a very educated, hungry, young workforce will drive uh, productivity gains, right? That, that, you know, the, the 15 years prior to the last 15 years, you just couldn't buy things like that. Uh, so it's really the last 15 years that you're starting to have breath where the, the listed market is uh, more than just state-owned enterprises. Uh, actually, a lot of interesting smaller cap stocks that were purely, you know, privately controlled um, became listed and, and, and were driving value and driving earnings growth. Uh, so I think you know, the last 15 years is more representative. Still, last thing, last 15 years, of course, you still had 
uh, you know, the global financial crisis. Uh, you had the European debt crisis that had some spillover effect to China. You had China's own crisis of the 2015 with their credit crisis. Uh, but you know, even through those ups and downs, uh, the the beta did deliver uh, about a 11 percent uh, return, uh, compounded geometric return, which is not bad. Uh, so yes, the beta itself, even if you go purely passive, uh, is decent. Uh, it is a lot more volatile than, say, the S&P 500. I found some of your research that you did on state-owned enterprises to be interesting because you divide them up into big, mega, country-wide state-owned enterprises and then more local enterprises that are localized. And uh, the research found that these localized state-owned enterprises were far less likely to produce profits. Could you dig into that a little bit for us? Yeah, I think most of us, when we think about state-owned enterprises, uh, we tend to have this very negative view, right? We don't think of them as actually companies. It, you just don't see it as very efficient, nor do they really care about, uh, say, stakeholder value. Uh, and that is not entirely true, but it's true enough. So in the data set, when we look at just the sort of city level, town level, state owned enterprises, when you look at all the operating efficiencies, they're just not very efficient. You know, they have poor margins. Uh, they have a lot of debt. Uh, if you look at all the you know, metrics for management efficiency and quality, just not very high quality teams. And you're not surprised uh, because they're, they're really, you know, controlled and dominated by local bureaucrats and then subject to all the issues that occurs when a local sort of political power boss uh, has you know, his sway with everything in town. But when you look at the big Beijing connected central scale enterprises, they tend to be, you know, well oiled machines. Uh, you know, the very best of the managers, uh, you know, are are in leadership positions, uh, and their efficiency ratios are very very high, and they actually tend to have decent performances over time. You also did research on, and I found this to be fascinating, by the way. The China companies that list in the U.S. market. We are here in the U.S., at least I've always been under the belief that, well, these things have to be go through a certain level of scrutiny and that the accounting has to be right before they can be listed on the U.S. exchanges. And there's a certain level of confidence that I would have in a Chinese company that lists in the U.S. versus just listing in the the local markets in Asia. Uh, So I would be more inclined as a U.S. investor to trust those uh, companies more, but your research actually shows the opposite. Yep, I mean, I had the same intuition as you did, Rick. I thought, look, you know, if you if you are willing to expose yourself to, you know, New York, right, to the financial money center, uh, and compete out here as a stock, right, you got to be pretty good when it comes to you know, dotting your eyes and crossing your t's and having good governance. As I did more research, I realized it was actually the opposite. So the listing requirement and the level of scrutiny uh, that you have to go through as a firm before you get listed in China is uh, ex- extraordinary. <laughs> and it's because the regulator at the stock exchanges who you know, is in charge of approving your listing has personal liability. So if you list and it was discovered you made up numbers uh, or for whatever reason you blow up later, that regulator has a lot of personal liability and his career is ruined and he might be going to jail. So they take forever to approve anything. And essentially, they actually uh, have this uh, very cynical view about the underwriter, the investment bank that's helping you go IPO, expecting all of you to be in cahoots to defraud investors. So they actually have a separate underwriting process. Now, in the U.S., it's not like that, right? In the U.S., our regulatory environment and our listing requirements is such that look, consenting adults making trades, right? If you're willing to buy shares in a Chinese company that doesn't want to subject itself to independent auditing, uh, hey, you know, it's in the disclosure. It's, it's, you know, buyers beware. So you can't blame anyone if you invest in these companies. So as a result, our listing requirements are actually very low. And most Chinese companies who cannot qualify for listing in mainland China or Hong Kong, uh, have chosen to list in the U.S. Sorry to interrupt, Jason, but could you say that one more time? Uh, So the listing uh, requirement for the U.S. is substantially lower 
than the requirements for mainland China and Hong Kong. So as a result, a lot of companies uh, who fail listing requirements uh, in mainland China and Hong Kong actually choose to list in the U.S. That's just fascinating. I, mean, I, 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 I would have never known that. You know, I mean, I, here I am, a U.S. investor, you know, thinking, oh, all these big companies that come over here to list, uh, they must be the cream of the crop to come over here to the United States and, and list on the New York Stock Exchange or something like that. But I would have never guessed that it's much more difficult to list as a Chinese company to list in China than it is to list in the United States. It's absolutely true. It's very strange, but it is true. <laughs> okay. All right. So you set up the shop over there and you first started out with factor investing and that was in 2016. But I imagine you learned a lot very quickly and things are shifting for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I learned was um, uh, while many of these uh, behavioral factors uh, that we research and discover in the U.S. Uh, can work and then do work well in China, uh, it is still a different market, uh, certainly with a lot more retail participation. Uh, and also with uh, accounting rules are different than the U.S. and, and also a, uh, a market structure that's quite different, right? It's still got a lot of state-owned enterprises. Uh, and as a result, uh, you have to localize the research, right? You got to take all these institutional features that's uniquely China and adapt your research. And so what we found is we found a lot of China-specific factors. Uh, so again, they're behavioral in nature, uh, but they exist in China only because either the data is available in China and not available in the U.S., so there's just sort of more ways to characterize that behavioral bias, uh, or they're just sort of features of the Chinese market that allow for retail individuals to express more of their biases. So what we found is you've got to really have boots on the ground, know that market, uh, learn the psychology, uh, and if you do that, you'll discover a lot more factors. Jason, a lot of investors are worried about the ESG factors, which are environmental, social, and governance. In other words, look, a lot of these are state-owned companies. They're not going to report human infractions. They're not going to report environmental infractions. Uh, people don't want to invest in China because a lot of things are covered up. What is changing in China to make more disclosure, and can we trust it? Well, today, if you want to apply ESG to Chinese stocks, if you hold them to Western standard by right, requiring them to, to be at the same level, clearly you're going to eliminate so many of the stocks uh, as to make the portfolio very concentrated and perhaps uh, you know, one that uh, is unlikely to produce return. But if you want to apply a rule which is more about the slope, meaning the speed at which they're improving, uh, you'll find many companies to, to be great ESG citizens. Um, that's because they're starting at a low base and the increased global pressure and increased self-awareness in terms of why ESG matters has actually encouraged a lot of them to make changes. You know, part of that is because as society becomes more wealthy, frankly, there's very little difference between a you know, Chinese parent and American parent, right? They all want better water, better air, better food safety, better work environment for their children. And they're going to demand that as consumers and uh, they're going to demand that as regulators. Uh, so we're definitely seeing improvement, even though the level today is clearly not international standard. And the one thing that is additionally interesting is governance is certainly the one dimension of ESG that is highly correlated with return in China. It may be less so outside of China, but in China it's very correlated. I think it's true for all emerging markets. I think you know, people who are more short-term oriented in the way they evaluate stocks tend to not care about governance, but in the long run, it matters. So it's an underappreciated factor in China. And if you focus on firms with great governance, you often end up having great returns. So even without requiring that, most portfolio managers in, in China and, and you know, ourselves certainly included in that uh, are very governance focused. And, and that's uh, critical in terms of driving portfolio value. You know, without getting too into politics at all, there's been some real changes in things like tariffs and that, that has affected some exports from China to the U.S. That is until the coronavirus hit. And then we all started spending our, our government checks uh, on Amazon and, and it, uh, it exports went up from China after that. <laughs> but uh, th there's a shift, it seems, out of China now uh, towards places like Vietnam. Are you thinking of expanding your your, your search for companies outside of China to 
someplace like Vietnam? Well, we're, we're definitely um, sort of looking for other alpha reservoirs. Now, the thing with Vietnam is uh, it certainly is even more inefficient uh, than, than China uh, because it's just an even younger uh, stock market. But it doesn't have a lot of depth and it doesn't have a lot of stocks. And then, of course, for a proper portfolio, you just got to have some breadth. And, of course, um, as a reservoir, right, uh, to, to really be able to extract alpha, uh, the reservoir has to be large enough. So for small markets with very little liquidity, and perhaps not enough wealthy household that enter the market to supply alpha, it, it's even though there's inefficiency, it's actually not likely for managers to do very much with them. Right? You're going to be severely capacity constrained. Uh, so in a way, if you think about big alpha reservoirs that, that are available in the EM basket, really, it's China and maybe a distant second would be India. And that has... That's uh, got the population. And they have a trading mentality in many ways. Yep. As that market becomes more wealthy, as uh, sort of the per capita GDP uh, starts to catch up for the Western world, like China has, uh, you'll see more of the household wealth uh, enter the stock market. And that's when sort of retail trading as a fraction of the market and overall market liquidity uh, will go up and, and therefore you know, making the opportunity uh, more meaningful for someone who, who wants to sort of be actively on the other side of those retail trades. Well, it's really been interesting. Uh, let's get to your company. And if our listeners want to learn about your company and what they might be able to follow you, where should they look? Uh, so while well, we've been running uh, a lot of different Chinese equity strategy onshore in China, uh, the success of that business has uh, convinced us to uh, export that. So we've launched uh, our very first active ETF in the U.S. So to find out more about that strategy, you can go to uh, you know, funds.ralian.com to, to learn about what it does, uh, whether it makes sense for you. Uh, we're, we're obviously looking to uh, build out a whole family of different uh, Chinese equities exposure and fixed income exposure uh, and other alternative exposures. Uh, and uh, you know, our belief is most investors are underexposed to China. So the correlation is definitely going to come in as a major benefit in terms of making your portfolio more diversified. And insofar that uh, you want to have exposure to a different currency, you know, Chinese, Chinese assets will give you uh, exposure to another major currency that might be emerging and rivaling uh, China, so you don't have to go to cryptocurrency to, to hedge against your dollar exposure. You can look at uh, you know renminbi-based assets, and of course you want to buy more growth, and it's differentiated growth, right? Because China just on a different part of the growth curve versus the U.S. This is a market where you can buy that growth and uh, buy it cheaper. But of course, to find out more about our research, go to our website, uh, Raylian.com, and if you're interested in the strategy, go to funds.raylian.com. Uh, that'd be great. I had to ask you one question because you brought it up, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency. China's central bank is rolling out a digital yuan, uh, making it the first central bank to issue a central bank digital currency. What do you think about this? Well, I think it's super smart, right? Because as we're looking at cryptocurrency, we often confound two things, right? One is the technology, the blockchain technology, which... It's just a superior technology in terms of settling payment, tracking the flow of funds. It's safer, and it's it's just more technological advanced, right? The existing settlement uh, process we have, you know, came from you know 60 years ago. Uh, so China is pursuing that. It's pursuing the blockchain technology. The rest of the cryptocurrency is a combination of that blockchain technology, which is wonderful, with a currency that you're not sure if it's actually a currency because it's not backed by anyone, not backed by anything. It's not really legal tender. Uh, so I think this actually helps investors in terms of really understanding uh, what the blockchain technology can do for central banks if they want to digitize their currency and improve the existing financial infrastructure. Uh, and then it helps us then understand, okay, if you take out the digital aspect and just have this new fiat currency issued by a non-central bank uh, collective like 
is there really value in that? So, so I think um, I, I, I think what China has done is genius in terms of adopting a technology. Uh, many central banks are likely to do the same thing. Uh, and as that happens, I think uh, you'll find existing cryptocurrencies to, to sort of be left behind. Well, I don't want to uh, upset too many of our listeners by getting into cryptocurrency. Uh, discussions on cryptocurrency were just recently banned on the Bogleheads.org website. But uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, Jason. I mean, you, you've done so well uh, in your career, and we just greatly appreciate you uh, being our guest today on the Bogleheads on Investing. Thanks, Rick. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. This concludes Bogleheads on Investing. I'm your host, Rick Ferry. Join us each month as we have a new guest. In the meantime, visit Bogleheads.org, Boglecenter.net, the Bogleheads Wiki, view our new Bogleheads live speaker series, get involved in your local Bogleheads chapter or a virtual community, and tell others about it. Thanks for listening.